so the first thing I will say um, is um, we're going to talk, this is your sort of things we're going to be talking about. Um, today is with a presentation. Uh, we're going to be talking about some statistics for trauma, the difference between PTSD and complex PTSD, um, how the fight, flight, and freeze response works, how a trauma impacts our physical, cognitive, and emotional level, and one of the, some of the potential things that we can all do to heal. Again, we will have 15 minutes at the end of the session to answer any questions that you might have. Um, so let's go with the statistics. Um, I think it's important to, as you can see here, um, statistics show that at least 50% of people will experience some sort of trauma in their life. And from those, you know, somewhere between, let's say, um, seven, to 8% we have post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, again, I think there's some people still coming. Um, just wanted to let you know that if you can mute yourself um, and also that I will respond to your questions at the end. The 15 last minutes are gonna be responding to such a questions. Um, so uh, like I was saying, uh, seven to 8% of the population we have post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I, as you can see, an interesting percentage of children and people in the military also experience a reverse of problems. So for instance, as you can see, um, you know, uh, of the cases reported to CPS, 65% relate to neglect. Um, there is 10% to sexual abuse. Um, let me just get this. And the 18% related to physical abuse. And of course, people that go to war, anywhere between, like the war in Iraq is a good example, anywhere between 11 to 20% have PTSD in a given year. So I think an important thing here, um, and when you think about you know, the people that don't report either in the military or people that have been abused that don't report, uh, the percentages are probably even higher um, there's, you know, some high estimations in, in terms of sexual abuse, um, rape, um, I mean, those sort of things are, in many guys, um, people don't necessarily go and report. So, um, as you can see here, um, trauma is definitely prevalent in our society. So that's the point I want to make here. Sorry. So now we're going to talk about, um, you know, the difference between PTSD and complex PTSD, because I'm going to be talking about those things and they're different. Um, according to what we call, you know, counselors call the DSM-5, which is basically the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. For somebody to be diagnosed with PTSD, um, basically, uh, they basically have to be exposed to some sort of traumatic event either related to death, uh, it can be a threatened, you know, be threatened to die. Uh, it can be a, an actual or threat or a seizures injury, or it can be also related to sexual violence. Um, by the way, um, these two things that can happen is they can be the person experiencing PTSD, or it can also be like a secondary in the sense of like, you know, maybe a first responder, like a firefighter or a counselor that is hearing, you know, stories that are very traumatic, that can create also PTSD. Um, and by the way, I think the other thing that I will mention is that in some of the folks in the mental health community, counselors and therapists in general, including myself, to be honest, um, we also believe that um, there are other one-time events um, which can be threatening uh, and provide PTSD. Uh, for instance, you imagine yourself a wife that um, basically heard about her husband having an affair. That can be extremely devastating um, and basically have you know, PTSD-related consequences. So definitely there are other things that are not considered PTSD by the diagnostic, you know, the DSM, um, but definitely probably have similar characteristics. Then specifically talking about uh, complex PTSD, um, that um, basically happens when people experience traumatic events for a significant amount of time. 
um, without for them the possibility to run away from it. You know, so for a good example is imagine your child, a child that spent most of her in their first 10 years or 15 years being abused by the mother or uh, by the stepfather or, you know, um, the other area that I would say is, you know, I've had situations where in marriages, um, either a wife or a husband had, you know, had some sort of violence. Uh, and that can be, you know, it has been for 10 years or 20 years or so. So that can also be complex PTSD. Um, I think the important thing that I would say when I say in this uh, slide is that um, when people go through very traumatic experiences, call it, you know, call it complex PTSD or PTSD, and they can't integrate them. We call them integrating. So somehow the brain doesn't process it. It leaves them as a feeling of emotions and you kind of lose the economy of the part. That results somehow in PTSD. Um, I'm going, as you can see there, you can see some examples of PTSD. Uh, for instance, you know, in PTSD specific it will be accidents, natural disasters, violence. Um, complex PTSD um, will be, you know, um, any sort of physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, and like I said, domestic violence. So um, that's an important point. So let's go on the next slide. And again, so let me go back to the systemic. So, so the, and we have we we have normally like what we call um, kind of very integration. I was saying. So, uh, the left side of the brain is kind of the rational part. Um, it's about you know the present. It's about um, rational part. Uh, it's about creating a story that is cohesive, very much about facts and statistics. And then the right side of, on the other hand, is very emotional, um, visual, spatial. Um, it's about, you know, basically my sensations. So I was saying that, you know, when we cry because somebody said something really sad, that's, that's kind of the right side of the brain. Um, and very much related to sound and touch, um, smell and the emotions. Um, basically, both the right side and left side side of the brain, uh, they, they work together. They make a meaning and an experience. So for instance, let's, let's imagine that you, somehow you're in the streets and you smell your mother's perfume while going shopping. Um, you may, maybe you start thinking about her and how much you love her, the things that you talked with her the last time you met. Um, and maybe you start planning what are you gonna do the next time you see her. Uh, and sexual memory is also, also physical. It's also physical. You feel that nurturing. You feel that warm in your body when you think about your mother. Maybe and that's what's example. So, like that's why when we talk about the right and left side of the brain, that's why when you know some people say, "Oh, it's you're much more right side," or if it's more emotional or left side, if it's much more rational, that's kind of thing. Um, so let's happen. Let's let's see what happens when there's danger, any sort of danger. Let's say you're, you know. When you start feeling that you know, you, you, you have, you're almost going to have a car accident, yes? Um, so when, when that happens, um, you basically, the left side of the brain is shut down. So that, at that moment, is you re we're left with the right side. Because in that moment, what we have to do is survive. We have to take an action. There's not any time to think, oh, I wonder what, what's happening with that car. I wonder if that's car gonna move. You know, I mean, we do it automatically. We don't even know whether we do it because there's part of, um, part of us that we're gonna explain a little bit more that takes action immediately. So um, basically we, like I said here in this slide, in that situation where there's any sort of danger, anybody goes through this, we make generalized conclusions, we take actions. And again, we don't have rationality. Um, the other thing that happens, um, and this is a very simplified version, so it's not exactly how it is here, but it's, it's a very easy way to explain to you what happens. So when we're in, there's a threat, the amygdala, which is, it's always kind of basically the threat detector, uh, that sends an emergency to the body and says, and gets helped, by the way, by the hippocampus. Uh, the hippocampus, basically what it does is has some information on past experiences. But then what happens is when there's, when, when the imminent danger, um, what happens is the amygdala says, okay, there is really danger uh, and it sends information which basically sends stress hormones. 
Uh, and those stress hormones basically provide the fuel needed to fight or flee. Um, so basically, immediately our heart rate goes up, we get a lot of pressure, and we're really there in the, um, you know, the activity. And this is very much automatic. We don't, we don't sit there ourselves and say, oh, you know, there's danger, we're going to do this. Um, so the other thing I want to mention that happens is let's imagine that um, you're, you know, you're in, in the wild and there's a bear. And basically what happens, the bear took you. You can't fly, you can't, you know, you can't fight either for whatever reason. So the system decides automatically, okay, this is the time when we go, we have to freeze. Um, so when the freeze response happens, because there's nothing we can do, there's no fighting that we can do, there's no flight that we can do, then what happens is the freeze comes in and then, you know, uh, it sends, the body sends endorphins, which is almost like body painkillers. Um, so they're like the Tylenol PMs of the body. Um, and it, but it does is basically it says, okay, since you're, you can't do anything, I'm gonna take up some pain, just in case this bear is gonna, you know, basically do something to you. Um, and then what happens next is the blood pressure drops. And what that does, does uh, that uh, basically does is you avoid bleeding in case of the attack of the bear. So that's what happens typically in any sort of danger. So now we're gonna talk about something else, but you know, before we start this um, conversation about what happens with trauma, I wanna talk a little bit about, um, I wanna talk a little bit about trauma itself. You know, I wanna say that trauma is very personal. So, you know, when you think about the pain and the situations that uh, you might be feeling, um, you know, basically what you'll be feeling are, um, are, are something that you feel that you can't just say, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, somebody has a bigger event than me, so they should be, you know, feeling double sort of pain. You can't say that. You can't say that, oh, my event is bigger too, I should be feeling. So trauma and, and everything we feel because of trauma is very personal. And, you know, any event might feel as big as any, you know, maybe uh, some sort of neglect might feel as big as some sort of abuse or, you know, anything else. So it's very personal, I would say. So now let's talk about a little bit of why trauma is so complicated. Um, so these are, this is the thing what happened with trauma. One of the most important things that happened to trauma is it makes people be very hypersensitive to perceived danger. And I, I wanna kind of bring up, um, when I say perceived danger is because sometimes the danger can be there, but sometimes it's not really there. It seems like it is. So it's, that's why it's perceived danger. Um, when somebody has had some little trauma, and I'm not saying everybody, but you might have experienced, uh, you know, maybe danger seems really bigger than it is because you're exposed so much information because of your previous trauma that it feels that anything else is really, really difficult. And, and it is difficult because that's what you're feeling. So I think that's an important point that it makes it very difficult. Um, so I think people who have experienced trauma, uh, I, I will make an analogy. And that's why I present this little house here. Um, and I don't know if a house where, um, you know, there's an alarm and the alarm detects everything, including a butterfly outside. So, you know, after a while you're in this house, you feel like, wow, is this the butterfly? Is a burglar coming in? What's going on? And you start saying, well, I'm just going to stay awake um, just to see if anything is going on. Um, and that's what happened with trauma. People have lived trauma. Is there a sensitivity to what's going on? And that continuous learning to, to past trauma uh, can definitely be tolling and very exhausting for trauma survivors. Um, another point that I want to make here is that, you know, we're in the pandemic and we're all together in this, by the way. So, um, you know, the pandemic has brought very much triggers for everybody known trauma survivors and trauma survivors. Um, so because what's happening is that, you know, um, because of the situations, we don't know what's going on. We don't know if we can go out, you know, everything, even going to a store might be difficult. It feels very unsafe. So using the analogy of the house, um, due to the pandemic, the alarm sounds are probably even louder nowadays, even more continuous than before. 
So for somebody that already had trauma, the pandemic brings more triggers. Um, so that's something I really want. And, and, it's, and it's fairly difficult because of that. So anyway, so that's why I was just saying. So now let's talk a little bit about symptoms. Um, you know, so one of the potential symptoms is intrusive symptoms. For instance, people who have um, some sort of trauma or PTSD um, have um, what we call flashbacks. So those are sudden and disturbing memories of past traumatic events. So when people um, are triggered, um, people with PTSD, it's almost like they are, you know, let's imagine that you, you were in the war and, and there was a bomb and you, there was, you know, people died and the people have trauma every time they go to, you know, a sort of flashbacks uh, or memories, it's almost like they're there. Their bodies are really there. Um, so it's, it, it's, you know, the blood pressure goes up, the, all these stress hormones go, you know, go in. Um, it's really like it's happening again, which creates a lot of stress for people that have survived some trauma. Um, another point I want to make is that not all the symptoms, you, you know, people that have had trauma, not, you know, maybe have a couple of this, maybe some, maybe all, but those are the potential, some of the potential um, symptoms. Um, the other thing I would say about the case of um, this thing about, you know, when you have PTSD and a situation is happening again, um, it's sometimes very difficult to think rational. When you are triggered, um, it's, you know, if somebody has trauma might act, um, maybe without understanding the consequences sometimes. Um, and, and it's sometimes those intrusive symptoms, um, which are, you know, by the way, the way that the, the brain is trying to heal itself is precisely through those nightmares, flashback memories. The brain is saying, let's work on this, let's work on this, I don't like it. But, you know, um, because like I heard somewhere in some presentations in the back, uh, some time back, is the brain is kind of lazy. So the, the brain says, you know, I, we, we need to fix this situation. And that's why it happens. Um, but, you know, those sort of flashback of memories can be really draining for people. Um, the other thing that it you know, says is that uh, for people that have had trauma, it can take longer to balance themselves in normal levels. So, you know, if you haven't had any sort of trauma and you, and you compare it to somebody who has trauma, you know, balancing the text take a bigger amount of energy and a bigger amount of, you know, you know kind of working to be able to, to, to balance. Um, you know, I have seen clients in session, um, especially couples, couples therapy is a good example, um, which have experienced trauma being consciously triggered um, and going to very difficult arguments. Um, and in such situations, it's really difficult to notice that they're being triggered by an own experience. For instance, you know, um, a traumatic event might feel similar uh, to, you know, when, so when the spouse, let's say the spouse is ignoring them, it feels like something similar that has happened before. But it's very difficult sometimes to realize and make the link because in the moment you're in the trigger, you know, so definitely uh, that's an area that happens sometimes in trauma. Um, the other thing that, um, the, the other thing that I would say is that the continuous pumping of the stress hormones in trauma survivors can impact memory. So, so, so you, thought, you know, sometimes see issues with attention, you know, very much difficult to put attention in things or work. Um, you can also see anger sometimes. Um, you can have uh, issues in sleep. Um, and a, a diverse set of um, basically health issues that happen, like, you know, the immune system can be attacked. Because you can imagine if you're always being attacked by this sort of sensation that you're in danger, um, there's a lot of stress hormones that are happening. So that, of course, can, um, can you know, very, very much um, work out the immune system, also headaches. Um, I've also seen and from clients in the past that people have had really bad trauma that they're like, yeah, they feel pain. The pain is real. It's totally real. Um, but doctors are, and they can't find what it is. You know, it's typical, like they don't know what it is. Um, in some cases. So, 
Um, so, you know, people that have um, trauma, like I said, can confuse what happened in the past with what is happening today sometimes. So because of that, sometimes new experiences might be stressful because, you know, when you are stressed in general by things happening, maybe some of those experiences, you know, you don't like the new things because the new things can be dangerous. And that's, you know, very much understandable. Um, so the other thing that I would say here in this slide is that trauma can also smash the sense of trust and securities um, and that others provide. So, because if you, you have a situation that is very, you know, let's say you have past trauma, um, and then, you know, you feel that, you know, you feel that it's difficult to trust others, of course, how could you? I mean, you, you have had any sort of situation that's been traumatic in some cases, sometimes it's difficult to trust. That, that can impact sometimes, you know, people that have had uh, in their relationships, sometimes in intimacy, um, for instance, um, if a child, um, if a child is abused uh, by their parents, you know, it's difficult to trust others. Or if somebody has been, you know, raped, I mean, the area of intimacy can be also be difficult. So definitely um, the intimacy area is also another part that can be, you know, can be impacted. Um, so as you can imagine, a very or a low system. So this is an alarm always going on, like running and running in your house. It creates anxiety. It creates depression and, you know, like I said, many medical issues. Um, so as a therapist, I've seen some difficulty for people that have experienced trauma. The other thing that I've seen is sometimes it's difficult to recognize their emotions and their physical feelings because if you have always trying to, you know, be away from those feelings because those feelings are really tough, you know, having those remembering those little feelings or last trauma, you're always trying to, you know, I don't want to think, I don't want to feel, I don't want to. So it becomes kind of part of normal life. And sometimes, it's, you know, it's, you know, it's difficult to just say, oh, you know, what do you feel? What, what, what's going on with you physically? So that's uh, some of the symptoms. And then, um, uh, now we're going to talk now uh, we're going to talk here um, about the symptoms that relate to complex PTSD. Um, so let's think about a little bit about the case, uh, the example, the child that basically was abused by the caregivers. So imagine that you're a child and you're like in the home, you're your parents and your parents are doing stuff to you that they shouldn't do because they should keep you safe, they can, you know, they should make you feel loved, they should make you make you nurture, they should, you know, all the things, but that's not going, that's not happening. Well, what happened with the child is in order to survive, the child says to himself, you know what, my parent or caregiver, it's, it's, they're good, it's not their problem. Um, and basically, um, and basically, they basically say, you know, if it's not them, it has to be me. So um, folks that have worked in the past, which have suffered sexual abuse, um, and, you know, maybe some sort of even childhood abuse or neglect, you know, they have a sense of guilt and shame about themselves sometimes, um, despite that they are the victim. But the feeling is not that they're, you know, is that they, you know, as a child, you learn that, okay, if these people who are supposed to be taking care of me are not there for me, well, I can't, you know, internalize that because it will be devastating. So the best way is, no, oh, it's me, I'm the one. Um, so, so but sometimes, of course, that brings pain, uh, loading, and all of that sometimes is taken inward. Um, the other thing I would say in terms of, um, complex PTSD, it sometimes it takes, because of course, you know, uh, these are things that are happening um, for longer periods, you know, so complex PTSD can take sometimes longer to work than, you know, just let's say an event where you, I don't know, had an accident, you know, that, so PTSD. Um, um, the other thing I would say in this, um, you know, kind of uh, slide is that, um, unfortunately, so, one of the things that, you know, if you, like I said, you want to avoid that sort of pain that you're having, some of the people basically what they do is their coping mechanism, you know, it can be avoidance, you know, maybe I don't want to see those people, I don't want to talk to people, it's uncomfortable to be in crowds, maybe, um, for others, it might be uh, substance abuse, 
um, well, there's many other ways. I mean, so sometimes it's just Facebook, you know, it can be social media, Instagram, if we basically, you know, we're doing it to shut down. Uh, and I'm not saying, you know, sometimes it can be relaxing, so it depends very much. Uh, but what they're doing there is uh, they're disassociating from the pain. Um, and that's what happens. Um, anyway, so I'm going to let it there. Um, oh, the other problem with that too is that if you're, you, when you try to let the pain go, you don't want to feel the pain. Sometimes the problem is that sometimes you lose the pleasure, the play, you know, the joy. So that's one of the issues. So I'm going to re, I'm going to let you. I really like this quote, this quote from one of the Harry Potter movies. I'm going to let you read it for yourselves. So I really like this quote um, because this, I think an important point is that trauma is not the person's fault, it's done to a person. So I think that's an important point. So now let's talk about healing. So um, I think, of course, the amount of work, like I said, required to, to heal depends on the person, the situations that happen, but healing is possible. I've seen it. I've seen it in clients and, and they, they can do it. That's, but you know, one of the things, um, I think one of the most important things that are needed when we, have, you know, when we have experienced trauma is find that space because what happens is typically um, we get triggered, there's an action, we feel that it's a threat response, somehow it triggers something in us and there's a reaction. So one of the things that is really important is to find that space, that space to say, what do I really wanna do here? Versus, okay, I'm just gonna react. And unfortunately the reaction is unconscious. It's not necessarily we're like, oh yeah, I'm gonna react this way. It's very unconscious because we got triggered. Um, so I think one of the things that are really important is to be able to find, um, you know, kind of the, 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 the you know, the space where you can kind of relax. Because one thing that I do want to make, you know, very, very clear in this presentation is trauma is physical. I mean, I'm not saying that it has to be a traumatic experience, it has to be physical, but I'm saying when, when we feel trauma, the area that we feel is in the body. We feel anxiety, we feel that pump in the, we feel that we can, you know, there are so many things, they're all, you know, so the area, the door to healing starts with the body. So that's sort of important part that I would say here. Um, so, you know, the healing is, um, it's not, by the way, the idea of healing is not to forget those stories. Those stories are part of life. Um, the focus is to handle emotions more severely. So, so, you know, avoiding negative impact. So that's what heal is. Um, sometimes we don't want to remember those moments, but we have to revisit them sometimes. But of course, I think it's very important that when we visit them, we do it with a person or, you know, it can be a therapist, anything else, group therapy, et cetera, where we feel safe, where we want to do it. Nobody can pressure us to do that. That's very important too. So I think the, one of the things that is really important to heal is, you know, basically creating a network. And when I say a network, it includes a lot of things here. Um, it might be an individual therapist, um, but also groups, um, because trauma groups are places where trauma experiences can be shared, yeah? Um, and, you know, individual therapy will work on individual things, then we go into trauma groups are really therapeutic because those are places where, you know, experiences that we have had can be shared with others that had similar experience. And that is really cathartic. Um, you know, having been able to talk about those things with others, um, it's really, really helpful. And also it's important, of course, that finding a group that feels safe, uh, that's important too. Um, the other thing is that, you know, in the, for people that have substance abuse, um, the support network um, is for instance, having a sponsor, you know, having somebody that, okay, my, you know, the sponsor is there, if there's some sort of need, you can call the sponsor. That is really helpful. So that's part of the Clue Support Network. Um, and by the way, I will also say that even pets are, from my perspective, a support network. Because they, the pets are, 
you know, they provide safety and it's many nurturing. We feel totally loved by a pet. So I think having pets is sometimes very important too. Um, the other thing is that, you know, as we tell a story in the group and, you know, we had the sponsor, with you know, individual therapy, we, it's, you know, as, as we tell a story on and on, it changes. We can tell it a hundred times and it feels different as, as we tell it. So um, that's an important point. Um, the other thing that I would say is um, finding meaning of the experience is also very supportive of healing. Because trauma, like I said, has been done to the people. You know, it's, it's, you know, it hasn't been, you know, uh, done by themselves in many cases. It has been done by other people or other circumstances or, you know, it, it might be trauma because of, well, the pandemic itself. Um, so I have worked in the past with trauma survivors who had suffered sexual abuse from, you know, the, the parents itself. Um, and it's devastating. Um, you know, and of course, because of that situation, there were, you know, relationship issues, anxiety, depression, um, even weight gain, because sometimes that feeling that, you know, we, we want to put something between me and the other. Uh, um, but through process of therapy, she was able to explore her trauma, um, find peace, and incredible enough, some sort of meaning work experience, which was vital for, you know, the work, the trauma from my perspective. Um, and she, I mean, this person, which is an incredible, incredible story from my perspective, it was one of my first cases as a therapist, I would say. Um, and she, um, she learned through the process to find some sort of empathy for people which had similar experiences. Um, and, you know, she wanted to help people. Um, it was about how can I do something for somebody else? And that's really important in the process of healing from my perspectives. So, um, you know, probably if anybody of you um, come to see me or have seen me, any of you are my, uh, my clients uh, and individual clients or couples, um, you will know that uh, everybody I tell, med med you know, meditation, meditation, meditation. Because mindfulness and meditations, um, it's incredible, incredible um, helpful for, you know, anyone, uh, trauma or not trauma, to be honest. Um, there are studies out there that have shown that people suffering from depression, anxiety, and chronic pain have benefited from regular meditation and training. Um, and I was also, you know, there's also studies that say, um, and at the end, at the end of my presentation, I have a couple, one, I think, study of that, but uh, it helps the immune system. It can help blood pressure. It can help people with emotional regulation, and it can help people react less. So I'm a uh, 150% fan of meditation and mindfulness. Yeah. And so meditation and mindfulness techniques can also build trauma survivors, um, focusing their emotions. Like I said before, sometimes people who have a trauma, it's difficult to see, you know, like feel, what do I feel? Because I'm always, you know, if you have a trauma, you have always separated from that sort of feeling. So by sitting down, um, it's incredible to be able to say, okay, you know, first time I can, I can see what's going on with me. Um, it basically also soothes the nervous system, and and because of that, it basically um, avoids going into a fight, flight, freeze response. Um, the other thing that mindfulness does is helps to activate the prefrontal cortex, so that's really good because then we can think, oh, okay, is this good or bad? Because if we have rational decisions, it's much more difficult, to see, easy to see, you know, what is my action, and if I do this. What are going to be the consequences in this relationship, with this situation? Um, the other one that I'm a super fan of uh, um, is yoga. Um, I really wish I could do more. And of course, the pandemic is not helping, but I found very good YouTube uh, yoga exercises. Um, there's tons, tons and tons. Um, interesting enough, yoga practices can improve cognitive functions. So anything, in, you know, the thinking process, let's call it. It can help mood and it can help stress coping. It also has excellent benefits in the area of PTSD because what it does, it, it uh, uh, decreases the overactivity of the amygdala. So, um, and there's of course the stress response. Um, so I think that's an, another point also. Um, so the other thing I would say is that, you know, here, 
And I think I mentioned it before, but I'm, you know, I think one of the most points that I want you to take with you is that um, many of our emotions are linked to body sensations. We don't necessarily think about it because we're like say we're depressed or we're sad or we're mad. We just think about it. You know, we think it's in our brain and that's where we feel. But if you go in your body, it's, it's in your body. It's really there. Um, you know, so people that I worked in the past, for instance, um, I've, I've heard that fear is linked to the stomach, you know. So when you start understanding such physical situations, you focus on them, you calm the physical feeling, and at the same time, the emotion. Um, so the idea is to go from continuous energy to feeling safe. So the body, from my perspective, is the door to healing. And of course, breathing is another one that is really important. Um, that basically to calm, um, that basically very important to calm the mind and the body. And the other one that I really like when people do, um, it's writing about trauma. You know, it's sitting down and putting that experience outside of you and seeing it outside of you. It's extremely important uh, because then you can go as slow as you want to. You can be in the moment. You can decide not to write more. You can decide to cry by yourself. It, it, whatever works, you know. Um, and from my perspective, it also helps some sort of trauma integration. Um, I'm going to, oh, the other thing I would say before I forget is healthy relationship with food. And it might be some people, you know, might be eating too much, that's bad, eating too less, that's bad, anything. So how you put food in your body, uh, and there is in the same study that, that I have somewhere, they talk about probiotics. They still need to do more research, basically, they say, but they have noticed how the gut and what we have in the gut, depending on those changes in the gut and those probiotics and what you have, there has been a link between other things like, you know, mental health, depression, et cetera. So the relationship, you, you know, we have with food is extremely important. Because that kind of tells the story of how much, what's going on with us. So um, let's see. Um, what I'm going to do now for two seconds, um, I want to do a little mindfulness exercise. I don't know where you are, but if you're with people and you feel unsafe, you can not close your eyes. But if you feel that, yes, I'm in a good place, I can do this, just for a second, I want you to, you know, if you can, close your eyes. I want you, you, as you close your eyes, I want you to sense your body. And as you sense your body, I want you to have a beat, like a breathing that is really deep. You're gonna do it. And as you breathe deep in, and let it go, I want you to say to yourself, relax. So I want you to breathe in, breathe out, say relax. Let's do it again. I want you to breathe in, breathe out, relax. As you stay in that sort of feeling, I want you to kind of sense your sensation of the breathing. Maybe air is coming in and it's kind of cold and leaving your body, which is warm. I want you to just kind of focus in that breathing for a second. And maybe as you focus in the breathing, just focus in the sensations that you have in your body. It might be, you know, maybe you have something in your back that feels painful or tension. Maybe your legs because you went running today. Whatever it is, just be with that sensation. Allow that sensation, but I let it go. I want you to focus and really let the tension go. And those sensations to let go. And as you feel that, I want you to scan your body again. And notice the difference. The next thing I want you to do is, I want you to, 
If you have any sort of tension in your body, imagine that you, you just let it go. It's almost like a river passes through your body and you just let go of the sensation. And you relax and you feel that. You see the importance, this is a small one minute, but you see the importance, maybe there were a thousand things in your mind today. There were things you had to do or did or didn't do. But in this moment, they really matter because at a minimal, even if it's just a small sensation or relaxation, maybe you felt that, even if it's minimal, it's okay. And that's what I think it's important, finding that space. And we do it through all the things that we discussed. The last thing I wanna talk about, um, I'm not gonna talk about the MDR. I work with the MDR, um, but I'm not gonna go through this. It's too much stuff and I wanna leave you some time to talk. Um, this is some of the books that I really like. Um, the f I'm a fan of the first one, which is The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Um, van der Kolk. And he talks a lot about some of the stuff we talked today, very much of the body. He talks about, um, you know, the impact of trauma and explains in more detail some of the potential ways to heal. The second one, Waking the Tiger, um, right, written by Peter Levine, is it talks about the role of body, you know, how uh, how a uh, body plays in trauma, the role that it plays. Um, the third one, which is the book by Herman, um, Judy, Judy Herman, it described the different sort of um, you know, basically, um, you know, what happens with the different sort of um, trauma that exists and these three stages of recovery. Um, anyway, so those, if you want to take a picture, um, you know, of this sort of slide because you're interested, there's many, to be honest, there's hundreds of things, but this is, let's call it one of my favorite ones. Um, okay, so I'm just going to give one more second and then just gotta go. And then, you know, this is kind of the bibliography, some of the places, of course, um, like I said, you know, this thing about the um, I was nerve and, you know, uh, the brain gut that I talked about. Um, so some other things um, that basically are, you know, kind of, I think worth mentioning here. So I am going to um, stop here now that we have 15 minutes, if I can find how to stop here. And I am gonna show my face. So anyway, so this is the presentation. If you have questions, I'm gonna read and see. Um, So uh, there's a first question. Um, I teach trauma-informed yoga therapy. Uh, does Eddings recommend this to clients? Uh, some, we have several people, maybe some more than others, um, but please send me the information. I will be very interested. Um, my email is steven at eddings.com. So very much would be interested in hearing your experience. Um, another person says here, how is self-suiting different from breathing? Well, I think that when we breathe, we self-suit, um, but it, we can self-suit many other ways. So I think being able to breathe just by itself, um, another fantastic one, you know, I mentioned the one that is breathing in, uh, and, you know, we're breathing in really uh, in depth, and then we breathe in and you say relaxation. The other one that I really like is um, the one that is basically uh, four, seven, eight. It's called four, seven, eight. And basically you breathe in, count to four, you wait there until you count to seven, and you let go to eight. Um, that's one that I really like, by the way. Yes. But I would say that um, you can self soothe many ways. You know, um, I, for instance, I tell you with the pandemic, uh, and everything going on, which is really stressful, of course, like anybody else. My self-suiting, one of my self-suiting strategies is walking. You know, I walk for 45 minutes or 60 minutes and I put this 
very relaxing music, or sometimes as a Hispanic person that I am, um, I put salsa, you know. So whatever it is that I feel like I need this, I put it on. So that's my self way to self soothing and, you know, so different things that help. Um, but for somebody else, it might be, you know, running or for somebody else, it might be painting or, you know, there's different ways we can self suit from my perspective. Um, but also uh, the other one that is really important is looking for ways to relax the body. Um, you know, so for instance, um, you know, basically being able to exercise is a very good way, but also sitting down, you know, tense in the body, let it go for 10 seconds. Um, that's really good. Uh, let's see, I have another question. See, um, so somebody asked me here that to talk about the connection between tinnitus and trauma. I mean, um, I, I don't can't say that I have a huge amount of experience in that area, but I do from all the readings that I've had is um, that, you know, for some folks that have, for instance, PTSD, um, sometimes it increases the tinnitus. Um, so there is, um, you know, when you think about, like I was, I was talking before, when you think about the amount of, um, you know, stress hormones that are happening to you, and, you know, maybe potentially, you know, always with blood, high blood pressure. Well, you think into some perspective, maybe there's also a connection there with tinnitus. Um, so I think that there's a bunch of different things, including, like I said before, pain, for instance, where for some folks, um, they feel pain. And I've had people working with me that they have gone through, you know, tens of doctors and they can't find the pain. So there are several things, including potentially tinnitus that might be, um, you know, maybe, maybe uh, you know, related to that. So that's what I could say. Um, is, is, do you have any other question? Hi, Steven, this is T. I have a question for you. Sure. Okay, so um, I would like to know if you are, if you know what your emotional triggers are, Mm -hmm. And you are, you know, triggered in a certain situation. Mm -hmm. um, is there a such thing as choosing the right response? I know that our body automatically reacts based mm -hmm. on the fight, flight, or freeze. But is mm -hmm. there such thing as actually choosing? the right response so you can soothe yourself within that situation? Yes, absolutely. That's a great question, T. So there's different ways of dealing with, you know, so um, for instance, cognitive behavioral. Cognitive behavioral very much um, works with the thought process. So how to work with the thought process. So people that work with cognitive behavioral, and I do to a certain extent, so if you, it's how to, how to work those thoughts so you don't get as triggered or as you get in triggered, how to get out of that trigger. So yes, it can be thought related from our perspective. Um, sometimes EMDR, for instance, you know, EMDR works in the, let's say, let's imagine that you had this, you know, horrible accident, you know, and you can never go to the highways. Um, of course, you're always triggered, so EMDR works over those emotions to try to see if the emotions, because what we lost is the connection between the, emo let's call it the emotion and the rational part, um, to make it simple. It's more complicated than that, but, you know, to make it very simple. So we're left with the emotions and the feelings, so EMDR works over those emotions uh, through a process, you know, that, that works. Um, so that's more, you know, that way. But the other way... Um, that you can do that is through relaxation of the body. And I think that's, I guess, one of my favorite ones too, um, because if we relax our body, we're less, you know, we are more calm and we make it, like for instance, I've, I've heard stories. Uh, I had a person that came to me and had a huge amount of anxiety and started to work um, on meditation. It started to calm down and it was, you know, it was easier to react in the office. So I think that, T, bottom line is there are different sort of ways. 
um, that you can basically learn to self suit or, or not get triggered. Um, they're all good, different ones. For some people, it's like, you know, they don't like cognitive behavioral. Some people love it. So it's very much dependent. But I think the different tools um, can help to that. I don't know if that answers my question to you. Um, <laughs> in all honesty, no. Can I give mm -hmm. you an example? Yeah, sure. Okay. So say, for example, uh, and, and I, I want you to respond based off of fight, flight, or freeze. Mm -hmm. Say, for okay. example, um, you have suffered from childhood bullying. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, you're in college or whatever. And mm -hmm. when you are around your peers, you feel social anxiety because you don't feel safe yes. in that moment. Yes. Would you recommend flight and leave? Or would you recommend fight and stay in the situation so you can get through that social anxiety and be able to interact? Or would you just recommend freeze and tell everybody leave you the hell alone? <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, I'm just like, you know, which, which is the best response? Yeah. Because your body is going to react. Yes, but what we need to work, um, what we need to work is to decrease that reaction T. So if you have been feeling, let's, let's use this example. If, if you have been feeling some sort of reaction because, you know, the person was, you know, in this case, example you made, you know, being bullied, we need to work with those sort of feelings that come from the bullying and being able to say, how can you calm yourself? Maybe some of, the, some of the things will be, let's call it, you call it fight, but I call it exposure more than fight. I don't think fighting is good in any case. I don't think flight is, you know, sometimes we have to do it, but can we start exposing the person slowly to these feelings? Maybe not necessarily, okay, let's go into a place that is full of people, but can we expose the person to, you know, situations? I think bottom line is we have to work the origin and the origin is the bullying. And it's important to work with those origin because, you know, if you're going to fight flight, you're always going to be reacting. And that's what I don't think is, um, you know, kind of helpful, if it makes sense. Yes. Okay. I understand now. So if, um, I was basically thinking, you're also talking about exposure therapy, correct? Yeah. So some of it might be exposure. Yeah. Um, some might call EMDR, some sort of exposure in the sense, you know, that you're, you're going to that sort of, in your, in your mind, in your brain, you're going into that sort of a building. So you could do AMDR or other things. So it's been able to work on that. Thank uh, you. The person says here, uh, have you personally had experience with trauma? Uh, yes, I have. I have had experience with trauma, uh, personal trauma, um, different things that happened throughout my life. And that's why I really like to work with people that had trauma. Because I think, um, I guess there's some empathy in the sense that I've, I've had situations that have happened to me and, and that um, I've been able to work through. And I really want to be able to help other people that, you know, to do the same sort of thing. So yeah, great question, thank you. Um, from, will you say, there's a question that says, um, would you say that the physical healing or coping methods so yoga breathing are more effective than the mental emotional finding meaning or understanding from others with similar trauma vice versa you know i think it's very personal you know it's in, it, you know like i said i i do emdr and some people love it and some people work with me in emdr and they say like oh this is the best thing in the world and some people are like no i don't want to do that <laughs> You know, I mean, for some people, you know, um, I, you work with the body. I think that working with the body and from my perspective, the first thing we have to do, it's really relaxing the body. That's very important. Do we do other things? Yes. Do we have to talk about the trauma? Yes. Do we have to work other, you know, ways to connect the trauma and integrate it? Yes. But from my perspective, you know, um, we have to use a bunch of tools. You know what I mean? So, like I said, like for instance, the case of the pandemic, I have to do a bunch of stuff to feel, you know, to feel that I'm able to sit down doing a full day of talking to people. So the tools I use work for me, maybe for somebody else will not. So I don't think necessarily 
that only sitting with some of the coping methods are enough. I think they're very helpful, but I also think that it's really important in some cases to do individual therapy, um, any sort of therapy. For some people, it's couples therapy, as a matter of fact, uh, working with a total drama together. So, um, see. I don't know if you read my question, Stephen, <laughs> but this doing? is what I was trying to type. Will going to sleep be a way of relaxing the body? Yes, if you sleep well, you know what I mean? Because the problem is for some people, uh, they don't necessarily sleep well. So for some people, you know, I've, I've heard and that, you know, sometimes having a nap can change the way you think things, you know what I mean? Um, some, I remember hearing this. So not from the mental health perspective, but um, I think that yes, sleep can be really good and important. If you don't sleep well and you have a horrible nightmares every day, you're not going to be able to. to um, uh, let's see. Um, so somebody is asking, you know, are you PTSD or CPTSD? So um, I will basically say more complex PTSD um, because of situations that happened to me. Um, when I was a very young person, and um, and of course the impact that I had and that sort of thing. So um, I think I've had experiences with people that work with PTSD that have had PTSD and CPTSD, and sometimes it can be as as difficult both of them. So anyway, any other question? We are we are at eight p.m. Um, how do you help people isolate their childhood trauma? that I have blocked out so many years. Um, like for instance, I know there are certain situations that you do recall, and do they need to be completely identified before going through them and identifying the triggers? Not, I'm gonna give you an example where not. Um, EMDR, EMDR, uh, you can work on some of the things without necessarily talking much about it. Um, we, ju we just not somewhere to start. You don't need to tell the therapist a bunch of stuff. Um, you know, so yes, you know, that's an example where I've seen that, you know, sometimes it's not necessarily needed. Um, I do think that, you know, because people have blocked those sort of feelings, it's really important to be able to, again, I'm probably like a very old record is basically they've, they first have to find ways to soothe themselves before they start telling the story, because otherwise it can be very traumatizing. You know, if you're like super anxious in telling the story, uh, you have to learn to be able to relax, to be able to tell the story, um, you know, from that perspective. Um, so, I mean, and you go slowly. I mean, you don't have to go to a therapist and tell the story immediately. You can just go slowly and, um, and get to a point where you feel comfortable and you can trust because it's important to trust the person you're talking to. So anyway, so... And then as you kind of work, you can start looking at some triggers that you never thought that were related to that trauma. You know, anyway. I think we have to close for tonight unless there's an emergency question. Um, well, thank you very much for being with me here tonight. Um, I really hope that this was helpful. Um, we have a bunch of people in Edding's counseling that work different social traumas. Um, we have people that work in somatic, we have people that work in EMDR. We have you know, a bunch of different people that work in trauma. So there's all sorts of people you can, and you can have 15 minute consultations if you don't have a therapist and they can kind of see which one you like best. But hopefully this was good for you and it was helpful. You have a great night. You take care of yourselves, um, be safe, and think about how can you really find ways to self-soothe, okay? Thank you very much.